Stripping Down Science. The Naked Scientists. This week, find out how astronauts have played the first ever game of, so- of golf in space. We'll also be hearing how bees are helping the armed forces to sniff out explosives. The Hubble Space Telescope, set for a makeover, is going to get a new lease of life. And also how scientists have invented an ultrasonic stethoscope to help doctors make diagnoses in noisy places. Hello, I'm Chris Smith. Welcome to this week's Naked Scientist Science Phone-In. Also here to help me answer your questions are physicist Dave Ansell. Hi, Dave. Hi. And also space scientist Phil Rosenberg. Hi, Phil. Hi, Chris. Yes, that's right. We're devoted the entire hour to tackling your science questions. And the wackier, the better. So if you want to know how many pieces of toast you can make with the energy from a lightning bolt, or how many organs you can live without, call, text or email. We'll be giving you the contact details shortly. And if you're in an experimental mood, join me for some kitchen science while I'll be doing some whiffy experiments with milk. If you want to take part, all you need is just some milk and a few tablespoons of vinegar. That's all you'll need. And as usual, we've also got a science teaser for you this week. Up for grabs is a signed copy of my book, Naked Science. It's got lots of fun and funky stories about science in it. And for a chance to win it, you just need to answer this simple question. What is or what are the Aurora Borealis? The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. First story today is our longest golf shot in the world ever. I'll say in the world. It actually wasn't quite in the world. It was actually Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Turin. He just hit the longest golf shot ever, although he did have a bit of an advantage over Tiger Woods. He was 360 kilometres up in the air and travelling at 7.7 kilometres per second already. He was actually in space, walking on the outside of the International Space Station. And now the whole stunt was actually sponsored by a Canadian golfing company who actually paid the Russian space agency to, well, an undisclosed fee actually, to uh, actually, for the publicity, um, to actually do this stunt in space. And they supplied a gold plated golf club for Turing to use. Why did it need to be gold plated? Um, you know, I'm not sure if there was an actual good reason scientifically or whether it was just. For the stunt, it looked good to have a gold-plated golf club. That's probably more likely, in my opinion, to be perfectly honest. Uh, now, unfortunately, as Turing, un- Turing is actually really well qualified to walk in space outside the space station as a cosmonaut, but he'd only ever played golf twice in his life and actually sliced the shot under the pressure. He was balanced sort of with his legs gripping a ladder on the outside of the space station with his little tether on holding him there sort of balancing the golf ball in zero G and he could only hold the golf club in one hand because of the uh, <laughs> the bulk of his uh, cosmonaut outfit um, and as he swung he, he actually sliced it and off it went to the, off towards the right hand side now this caused a little bit of a problem actually because um, the idea was he was going to hit it backwards relative to the way the space station was moving right. which meant that it was going a little bit slower than the space station so it should drop in orbit and no quickly... danger of it coming home to hit the space station exactly so it would drop quite quickly and then burn upon re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere uh, now, unfortunately, he sliced it off to the right, so NASA had to track it to make sure <laughs> that she had the cameras tracking it to try and make sure that it didn't wasn't going to come back and, and get them on a later. There's orbit. no danger that it might hit a satellite or something. Well, they, they think not. Uh, they did track it, uh, as I say, with these images, and they reckon that it will probably be in orbit for about two to three days, uh, which would then before it will enter the atmosphere and burn upon re-entry. Uh, and they reckon that will probably be a shot of about a million miles, so the longest golf shot ever. But actually, just in case, they made the golf ball ultra-light because they weren't convinced that he could hit it in a straight line anyway. So they thought he could actually hit it and it just go up at you know, a tangent and actually hit something on the space station, you know, hit an external antenna or something. So they made this golf ball that was about 10 grams, which apparently is about the same weight as a dollar bill. It's like so, one of those kiddies' golf sets, isn't it? It's good to know that these Russians trust their cosmonauts, isn't it? Absolutely. And as I say, they, they were paid... To do this, the, the, the Russia have got quite a history of taking money to actually do these sort of stunts. They take paid visitors up to the ISS, International Space Station. Um, whereas NASA actually have got a vi- re- really strict no profits policy. They're not allowed to make any profit from anything, and they were really quite concerned that the Russians were going to do this on the space station. So I wonder what they'll use as the green. I suppose in space it would have to be the black. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe you can try and aim for a planet or something. <laughs> aim for a star. If you get it at the star, that's it. Hole in one. Or maybe Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's pleased to see that some scientists in the US still have their feet firmly back on the ground because the US weapons scientists at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is over on the west coast of the US, of course, have been looking at ways to detect explosives. And they've come up with a very cunning way to use the humble honeybee because bees have an incredible sense of smell. They don't have a nose like us, of course. They have antennae, those two projections from their head. And they're covered in receptors. These are docking stations for chemicals. And when the chemicals lock on, they trigger nerve impulses. And that's how bees smell. 
So Tim Harmon and his colleagues at the Los Alamos National Lab wondered whether bees could be trained, just like Pavlov's dogs historically could be trained at the ring of a bell to salivate. Could bees be trained to do something when they smell a whiff of an explosive? So what they've done is to train bees by feeding them at the same time as presenting the smells of various explosives, like they've tried C4, they've tried dynamite, they've also tried the howitzer propellant that people are using in homemade explosives in Iraq. And what the bees do is if you pair that smell with a sugary solution for them to drink, pretty soon they begin to associate that smell with being fed. And so what they've done is built a sort of frame that mounts three bees in it, and it's in a shoebox-sized apparatus, and it blows air that it's collecting past the bees, and there's a camera watching the bees. And as soon as the bees get a whiff of the stuff coming in, of course, they extend their proboscis, their mouth parts, thinking they're going to get a drink. And so the camera registers a hit, and uh, because there's three, whoever has the majority vote says, right, this must be whatever is present in the environment. And so they're now confident that this could be used by soldiers at the front line. It could be used in airports as a very sensitive way to pick up explosives in people's luggage, but also on those remote-controlled robotic uh, sort of bomb disposal units, the ones that drive themselves around. They could have a remote, a bee sensor... And they can wheel out the bee sensor and sniff a, p- a suspect package. And if the bees say hot, then the machine says not, and uh, you know it, it blows it up. Isn't it kind of dangerous? Because if someone happens to be smuggling flowers in their thing, the bees going to go, "Oh, <laughs> yum, yum, flowers!" <laughs> <laughs> and all, if you carry flowers in your luggage, you can get searched every airport you go to. I do, I do anyway. I, I, when we were flying to America, we unfortunately forgot we had a whole lot of fruit in our bag, and the sniffer dog got us. Very yeah. clever. I mean, just yeah, they're trained to come and sit down next to you. And so there we were collecting our cases. Next thing we know, I had this sniffer dog. And it wasn't just sitting down. It was going absolutely mad over our luggage. And, and we had some oranges and things. So why it? was it the fruit? Was it because people are known to smuggle drugs in fruit? Well, so not, well it's not drugs they're after. It's because no one's allowed to move things that could grow. or it, It's material that could contaminate another country. So New Zealand are really quite, quite tight on this. And when their Olympic athletes won some laurel leaves in the Olympics recently, then the, the, the New Zealand government removed their laurel wreaths from them. And, and actually burned them because they said they, could, they could contaminate New Zealand. New Zealand yeah. <laughs> now, scientists in the US have um, been trying to help doctors because doctors, when they're trying to listen to someone's heartbeat with a stethoscope, find it very difficult if it's noisy, you know, if they're in a helicopter or even just on a noisy road. Only about 80 decibels can make it very difficult to hear what's going on inside. Now, Adrianus Houstoner has developed a system which uses ultrasound. This is the stuff which you use when you see the nice pictures of babies inside people. Um, and this, they shine this into your body. Now, that, this gets reflected back, and then they can hear that, listen to the reflections. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed if you've got a siren coming past you. When it's coming towards you, it's a higher pitch. When it's going away from you, it's a lower pitch. It's so like the Doppler effect. It's called the Doppler effect, yes. So if the ultrasound bounces off something moving towards you, then it's going to get pitch move up and moves away from you pitch goes down now those sounds which the doctor are listening to are only these vibrations so if you take the amount of this doppler effect and feed it into the headphones you should be able to hear something very close to what a doctor would have heard so would that be like the heart moving up and down in the chest then the movements causing the doppler effect yeah so you'd be able to actually see the heart moving rather than listen to it but it's a, um, there's much less noise there's very little noise in the ultrasound so this will work even in at uh, the front of a rock concert even about 120 decibels you could listen to someone's heart and diagnose uh, so so where or what sorts of environments are doctors likely to be operating in, pardon the pun, where they're going to need that kind of sensitivity? There are not many rock concerts where people do surgery, are there? But if you're in a battleground or a helicopter, or especially the military are really interested into this because there's things exploding all over the place and the poor doctor is trying to work out whether the heart's working properly and keeps hearing bombs. Excellent. OK, well, now I'm just going to quickly talk to you about the Hubble telescope. Now, this is a... If you haven't heard of it before, it's a, a giant telescope that's been put in orbit around the Earth. And it's been up there now for somewhere around 15 years. Um, and it's actually been due for an upgrade now since about 2004. Uh, the, space, uh, the telescope itself is actually built so that astronauts could visit it using the shuttles and uh, actually replace parts on it, uh, parts that would wear, and also upgrade the instruments that are on, on board. Um, now, unfortunately, after the uh, Columbia shuttle was destroyed on, on re-entry, um, the last like, mission to uh, upgrade and to repair Hubble was cancelled, and that was in, supposed to be in 2004. And there was a lot of uh, speculation about whether or not this mission would go ahead or whether Hubble would literally be left to die uh, up in orbit. Um, the big problem was that on board Hubble are, are gyroscopes, the sort of big weights that spin around, um, which hold Hubble... Um, in place, they allow you to direct it and keep it stable. Now, Hubble requires three of these to uh, accurately keep its position, uh, and it had three spares as well, so it had six in total. Now, two have already died, uh, of basically worn to the point where they can't be used anymore. 
Um, so it's only got one spare left, and the big worry was that this last one was going to break up or, or be, become worn and not be able to be used, and eventually that Hubble would have to be just left to drift because we wouldn't be able to point it at stars anymore. Um, now, the new mission is actually going to... has now been decided that it's going to go ahead... Uh, now that the uh, the shuttles have, have managed a few successful launches, everything seems to be OK with the shuttles again. So it's going ahead, and that, this will extend Hubble's lifetime up to about 2013, by which time a new space telescope will have gone up into orbit, which is the James Webb Telescope, and that will have gone up into space. People uh, have got real high over. hopes for that, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it will be the next generation, as it were, bigger and better than Hubble has been. But Hubble itself has come up with some remarkable things in the past, and it would be a real shame if it couldn't carry on. I mean, Hubble has done things like detected the expansion of the universe and worked out how quickly it's expanding and worked out that unlike what we expected we expected that the universe is expanding but the gravity will be pulling it back and slowing it down and actually what we've Hubble has found is that it's getting faster as it expands so rather than things getting further and further away and slowing down they're getting further and further away and speeding up this is this dark energy that you might hear some astronomers talking about so Hubble is credited with that discovery and it's also been able to look back at some of the fastest distances in the universe, really to nearly the farthest reaches of the known universe. That really is Hubble sort of stuff. And the, the, new stu- the new upgrades are going to involve replacing these gyroscopes, replacing the batteries as well, which are a real problem at the moment, and uh, also giving it a new digital camera, which will be a 16 megapixel digital camera to take some fantastic images with. Now, who here likes a drop of red wine? I know you don't, Dave, because I keep trying to get you to drink some and uh, while I'm enjoying the entire bottle. But you like red wine, Phil? You know what? I can be partial to a little bit of red wine every now and again. Do, where do you get your red wine from? And don't just say the off-licence. I mean, where geographically in the world do you get your red wine from? If I'm perfectly honest, I, I get it from anywhere that's selling it on offer, Co-op, half price yeah. from, yeah. <laughs> uh, OK. Well, the thing is that we should be paying probably a bit more attention to the label, it turns out, because for a very long time we've been told red wine is very good for your heart. It will reduce your risk of heart disease. But not all red wines are equal, says Roger Corder, who's from St Bartholomew's and the London School of Medicine um, down in Whitechapel in London. Because he said, as a wine drinker, I was motivated to try and find out whether it was true that red wine is good for me. So he went and analysed red wine that you can buy off the shelf. It turns out the best wine to drink is from southwest France or from Sardinia. So you're looking for a kind of grape called the Tannac grape. Or from Sardinia, uh, the grapes that tend to grow there tend to be very rich in these substances called polyphenols. And there's one substance in particular called procyanidin, which is one of these polyphenols. And what it does is it switches off the production of a chemical in the walls of your blood vessels called endothelin-1, which has been linked to heart disease. So as this is very, very richly expressed in this particular type of wine and these grapes, then you should be drinking those ones because other grapes don't have very high levels of it at all and you won't get the same benefit if you go and drink those ones. So southwest French and Sardinian wine, the Australians, not, not such good news this week, I'm afraid. Is this because they're growing the grapes in a certain way or they're growing certain grapes or is it particularly just the climate in that area? There's, there's a couple of reasons. One is it's that grape species. Two, the uh, more ultraviolet radiation a grape is exposed to, the more of these protective chemicals it makes, because it doesn't just protect us, this chemical, it protects the grape itself. And the, the grapes respond to ultraviolet by making more of this stuff. So they boost their production to protect themselves, and then, of course, if you make wine from it, you're protected too. The Naked Scientists, supported by the Wellcome Trust. This week, Derek and I went to Southfield School for Girls in Kettering, where we met Amanda and Verity to talk about the science of milk. Hello there. Today we've actually come to Southfield School for Girls in Kettering in Northamptonshire, so welcome to you. And uh, with me is Dave and also a couple of volunteers from the school to help us do the experiment. So firstly then, Dave, what is it we're going to be doing today, very quickly? We're making a horrible mess with milk. OK, there you go. So you're making a horrible mess with milk, and you can, of course, do this at home. So listen out in a minute for what you need. I'm sure you've got the stuff all at home. That's cool. And also we've got two volunteers here today, so if you guys could give me your first names and years you're in, please. Hi, I'm Verity. I'm in Year 12. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm also in Year 12. Fantastic. OK, guys, and you've come to do some science, so we need to know if you like science and also, if so, what you like about it. So what about you, Verity? Um, I like it because there's always something new to learn about it. All right, then. Hopefully we'll be managing some of that today. And yourself, Amanda? Um, my favourite subject, physics. I just love it because it's truly fascinating the way it ties into everyday life. All right, OK. And this will tie into everyday life, although I'm not sure it's quite physics, is it? But... You know, everything's physics. Yeah, exactly. So it all relates, doesn't it? So that's fine. OK, so at home then, if you'd like to do this, then this is what you need. Basically, firstly, you need some milk. Um, you probably need about half a pint of it will be fine. And uh, is it any kind of milk? Semi-skimmed, skimmed? Skimmed is slightly better, but anything should work. 
Okay, that's good. All right, then. Secondly, you need some vinegar. Okay, and again, any kind of vinegar, Dave? Yeah, any vinegar, lemon juice, anything acidic. Orange juice will even work. Okay, so something that's quite acidic, but vinegar is, you know, is, is absolutely fine. And then you need some kitchen towel, a few pieces of kitchen towel or tissue or something like that. You're going to be using that as a kind of filter. Okay, and finally, two glasses. We've actually got two pint glasses here, but basically two fairly large glasses will do absolutely fine. And then you've got to listen to Dave's instructions. He'll be instructing Verity and Amanda, actually, on what to do to set it up. And uh, please do so. So here we go, Dave. What do we do? So this is incredibly simple. So Verity, if you'd like to pour about half a glass of milk in there. There we go. OK, half a pint of milk in there. Yeah. Right. And, and then? And then all we do is we pour in some vinegar, maybe a couple of tablespoons until something interesting happens. OK. And I mean, do we really have to be that precise? I mean, do we need to measure it out? Not especially. As long, if you put too much in, it's not a problem. And then after that, once you've kind of mixed that in, do you actually have to stir it at all? Uh, maybe stirring it a bit would help and then pour that through a kitchen towel and take out all the lumps and have a look at them. That would be wonderful. OK, then. So basically, you've got to get the half pint of milk in the glass. You've got to add a couple of tablespoons of vinegar, something like that, to it. And then you've got to filter it through some pieces, probably a few pieces of kitchen towel, something like that, into another glass and tell us what you see, basically. And, uh, and that's all there is to it. Of course, Verity and Amanda are here. I'm sure they're itching to do this, but uh, we're going to make them wait. But Amanda, firstly, what do you think is going to happen when we mix the vinegar with the milk? I'm really not sure. Have, have a wild guess. A uh, bit of neutralisation, possibly. All right, neutralisation. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, the acidity of the vinegar, perhaps mixing with the alkaline milk. All right, then. And, uh, and Verity, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, maybe some sort of crystals will form. OK, and also when we're, we're going to pour it through some filter paper as well. So what, what might happen there? Well, the crystals will be left in the tissue paper. All right, OK. Right, well, there you go. We've got some predictions. So we're going to see if that happens later on in the show. So if you at home would like to do it, please do so. And then tell us what you see, because uh, if you get the right result, then you can win a prize from us, the Naked Scientists. So you can ring uh, 08459 25 2000, and you can also email chris at thenakedscientist.com. Until then, anyway, it's uh, all from Southfield School for Girls. So we'll be back here later on in the show to find out what happens. Until then, it is back to you. Thank you very much to Derek. And uh, if you want to have a go at that experiment, remember, of course, bit of milk, splash of vinegar, whip it up. If you're first on the telephone with the correct observation as to what happens and give us some kind of interpretation or explanation and you could be walking away with a fantastic prize, a pearl beyond price. It's a copy of Naked Science, my book full of fun and funky science facts and figures and I'll even sign it for you. So if you auction it off on eBay, it'll be worth, well, three times the price. Got loads of questions coming in. Anne uh, has written to us and said, Dear Naked Scientists, I'm a graduate student across the pond here in the US. I've got some questions about the nature of fire. What's the actual flame made of? I think I recall someone once telling me it was made of carbon. Is that true? And if so, can substances that don't contain carbon actually burn? It depends what colour the flame is. Um, if you've got a very yellow flame, um, but with what's happening in a flame is you're reacting something with oxygen, say a, fu uh, a fuel, the, the thing's actually got to form a gas to form a flame. So you've got a gas coming up, and then that's reacting with oxygen, which is giving out lots of heat. Now, if that's reacting very cleanly with oxygen, you tend to just get a plain blue flame um, or possibly white. Um, now, if you get little soot particles in there, they glow very brightly yellow. So if you see a really yellow sooty flame, that is the carbon you're talking about glowing. Um, you can put other things into flames, which is how they make, um, which will give colours. For example, if you put copper salts in, they can go blues and greens. Strontium makes nice red colours. And that's how you make fireworks, is it? That kind of stuff. Yeah, that's how you make the beautiful colours you get in fireworks. I've got an extension to the, this uh, actual question. It's probably aimed at you, Phil, as a space scientist here on The Naked Scientist. This is from Sam, who says... Um, what would happen if you lit a match in space? Obviously, you need to do this in an environment where there's some oxygen. But he says, um, I was asked this question to one of my science in, teachers in school and he was baffled by it. Um, considering there's no oxygen atmosphere on a space station but no actual up or down, what would be the structure of a flame if you lit it in space on a space station? Well, basically, like you say, there's no up or down in space. Now, how a flame would work is that the flame goes upwards because of convection. The hot gas created by the flame rises. As you say, there's no up or down in, in space, so the, the gas literally just forms a sphere around where it's burning, so you just get sort of a circular flame. But actually, stuff doesn't really burn very well because this process of the gas going upwards gets rid of the carbon dioxide that's been formed in the burning process and sucks in more oxygen to keep the flame stoked, keep everything burning quickly. But in, in space, because this stuff doesn't happen, uh, actually you don't get very much oxygen getting into the flame, so actually it's quite a poor flame that, that is formed. So essentially it chokes itself in its own waste products, the yeah, flame, and, and just goes out? Yeah, well, quite possibly, yes. 
I guess if you're near an air current or something, you get something which looks much more like a conventional flame. Yeah, if you're near some you know, air conditioning duct or something on the International Space Station, then you'd get the, the blow-through of air would, would give you sort of something looking more like a flame. Andy's cruising down the A120. Hello, Andy. Hello, Mike. What do you want to talk about? Um, spice. The expansion of it. According to the Hubble Space Telescope, Space, space Telescope, the known universe is expanding, yeah? If so, what is it expanding into? Because, as far as I was aware, space is a void. Um, how far can it expand? Well, it's quite a good question, actually. And uh, if I'm perfectly honest, no one really knows the answer. There are a lot of interesting ways to look at it. Uh, one way, and I think probably my favourite way, is if you imagine that this world was only two dimensions, so you were stuck on a flat bit of paper. Now, that paper could be a giant globe, and as it's expanding, it's expanding in three dimensions, but the, the actual surface area that, we, that you could see as a two-dimensional being would be getting bigger and bigger. Now, if you could imagine that our, we see the world in 3D, if you could imagine that was maybe a, actually just the surface, as it were, of a four-dimensional shape, which is getting a bit bamboozling in the, in the head, and I really struggle to imagine it, then that would be one way that you could imagine it, uh, uh, that we're actually in more dimensions than we can see, and then we're expanding in these other dimensions. Because the, a lot of people say, well, you know, what's it expanding into? Because there's, you know, there must be something, there must be space made up. But, of course, if the universe is everything, then as soon as it expands, then it, it just makes the thing that exists bigger. Yeah, well, that could, that could work as well. I mean, there are also ideas that there are men, millions of different universes all sort of competing for space, growing at different speeds, like little bubbles, and we're sort of crowding each other out. And actually, maybe the black holes that are formed in our universe actually spawn through to other universes that are being created. So there are, it's really one of these questions that's more philosophy almost than science. Everyone's making guesses and everyone's trying to get the evidence to prove one, one way or the other, and that evidence just isn't here yet. Andy, do you want to have a quick go at the quiz? Yeah, go on in. Across the world, we consume nearly 300 million gallons, that's over a billion litres of oil, every single day. Do you think that's fact or fiction? I reckon fact. Yeah, the average daily oil consumption in 2004 was 6.7 million barrels. And there's 42 gallons a barrel. Um, and compared to 1994, our double has barreled from... Dub our, <laughs> our consumption has doubled from 3.1 million barrels. That's a lot of oil, isn't it? Next question, Andy. The biggest consumers of crisps in the world are the Americans. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Absolutely true. Who do you think it is? Uh, Offhand. Us. I've got a packet of 24 on a passenger train. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, it is us, it's the British. We pack away 10 billion bags a year of crisps, more than the rest of Europe put together. Good for us. Andy, well done, two out of two. Good, yeah, mate. Thanks for joining us. Laying the facts bare, Ooh. the naked scientists. Here's a question for you, Chris. Um, this is from Cathy Manson in Australia, and she's got two red-back spiders in her bedroom. <laughs> 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 And she thinks, she thinks okay. they're very useful because they catch flies, and flies are worse than spiders. And she's right. been watching them for a while, and they keep making more and more silk. And why don't they ever run out of silk? The spiders are, are quite clever because, in fact, uh, ancestrally, they go back a couple of hundred million years, in fact, we think. And they have glands at the back end of the spider, and now, it turns out, also on their feet that make silk. And what scientists think is that the glands on the back of their abdomen that make silk are just adapted limbs. They're just limbs that have probably atrophied and turned into just the glands to make silk, where they used to have some legs. And that silk is the reaction of, of proteins. So you have a chemical reaction going on at the back end of the spider that literally spins silk on demand. So the spider eats something that's got protein in it. So when it goes and catches something in its web, it injects a venom into that, into that insect, which kills it by paralysing it. But the insect is, is paralysed, so it doesn't die instantly, so it remains fresh. The spider injects digestive juices, which liquefy the insect and because an insect is like a husk it's got a hard skeleton around the outside with the soft bits in the middle the spider can literally suck the goodness out of the insect leaving behind a dry wizened up shriveled skeleton that's why you see these sort of husks of insects left under spider webs all the protein and goodness from the inside of the insect ends up inside the spider the spider digests that absorbs it and then the proteins go to the back end of the spider and they get turned into new web and amongst other things the spider needs to make and some spiders have taken this a step further because what they've done is to make the process even more efficient by eating their own webs because web is just protein and so by eating their own web they're getting the proteins back into their body and they can reuse them cool 
because spiders' web is incredible stuff. It can absorb immense amounts of energy. Sort it's of got the tensile strength of steel, hasn't it? I mean, scientists are now looking at ways of using it for bulletproof vests, for example. There's there's ways of if you can make this artificially in enough uh, quantities, you've got something with the tensile strength of a, of a piece of steel and the ability to stop bullets much better than a bulletproof vest. Which means rather than police having to go around in these very thick outfits, which restrict movement, a bit like that cosmonaut that Phil was talking about with his golf club, one armed golf swing. You know, police are, are encumbered by these big body suits. If you could make it out of spider silk it would be A, lighter, B, a breathable fabric, so it wouldn't make it so hot and uncomfortable, and, and it wouldn't restrict your movement so much. A uh, question again here for, Chris, for you, actually, Chris. Um, Fucking question, me. Absolutely. <laughs> You're very in demand today. Uh, this is from Bob Archibald, actually, in Berkeley, California. Uh, he wants to know... He understands that the body needs oxygen, and the heart and the lungs and blood perform the essential roles of getting the oxygen to where it's needed. But what happens physiologically when the body is cut off from oxygen? When someone is suffocated, for example. Oh, why do you go unconscious so quick and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the the thing is that the body has an incredibly high metabolic rate, so you're burning off oxygen really, really fast. The brain has the highest metabolic rate. In fact, the retina is the part of the brain with the highest metabolic rate. So that's why when you stand up out of a hot bath very, very quickly, you get a very brief dip in blood pressure because all the blood's in your legs and the result of that is that the retina gets slightly less blood for a fraction of a second and that's why you see those funny funny lights and you feel a bit woozy but then as your blood pressure comes back up again the brain gets a good supply back but that's evidence of how oxygen dependent your brain is if you cut off the supply for a fraction of a second because the tissue is working so hard it's putting out so much um, it's got such a high metabolic rate and having to put out so much energy a fraction of a second interruption in the blood flow just makes you, it makes you lose consciousness and so tissues like the brain are incredibly sensitive to just a minor interruption in their oxygen supply and yeah, that's why you faint absolutely i must admit we were doing training at work uh, using gases and cryogenic fluids and if you breathe air that's got not enough oxygen in it apparently two breaths and you you fall unconscious well when i was at medical school we did an interesting experiment where they simulated going to the top of a mountain. So I said, oh, I'll be the subject. And they put me in on, laying on this table and made me breathe out of this bag, which they, they'd put half the normal amount of oxygen in. So it was 10% oxygen instead of 20% you normally find in the room. And the consequence of that was they were trying to see if my blood would get slightly less oxygen dissolved in the bloodstream, but it didn't actually work very well. <laughs> I breathed this entire bag of this stuff for about 20 minutes, and it didn't really reduce my oxygen capacity Maybe terribly much. So, Maybe you should well, be a mountaineer no, then. If, if you do go mountaineering what you do to compensate is you just breathe more so you can you pack more breaths in and your hemoglobin is very good at grabbing oxygen out of the lung and putting it into the bloodstream and in fact a red blood cell takes about 0.8 seconds to go across through the tiny blood vessel around each of the air sacs in the lungs but it only takes about 0.3 seconds for the oxygen to get into it so there's a, f- a safety factor of at least threefold so it take, it's got three times longer to pick up oxygen than it needs so all it has to do if you breathe a bit harder you just shove more oxygen into the lung and then you can pick it up yeah, this is also why you've got to be careful breathing helium balloons because there's no That's oxygen true. in that helium. And it can, I did it a while ago and it just made my head go incredibly <laughs> dizzy. You should be admitting that, David. Look, this is a really interesting question for anyone that's a would-be burglar. Okay, this is how <laughs> to steal stuff. Okay, this is actually from uh, she's Catherine, who is Catherine Courtney, who's in Texas. She says, "I'm an experimental psychologist from Fort Worth in Texas. I listen to your podcast. Uh, that's NakedScientist.com, by the way. You can get our, our show on the internet if you want to hear it and download it because you can't catch the radio program." But she says, "I'm." big fan of your show and your British accents. I've got a question for you about the little magnetic strips that are being used to prevent shoplifting and they cause an alarm to go off if they're not demagnetised or something when you purchase them. I bought a wallet several months ago and had one of these little strips in it. I watched the store clerk run the wallet over a machine and then when I carried this wallet out of, out of the store with me, it didn't set any alarms off. But a couple of weeks ago, as I was entering a department store, all the alarms went off as I walked in. They went off again when I walked out. No, I wasn't stealing anything. This began to happen every time I entered or, exit or exited a store that had these sensors at the doors. In frustration, I emptied the contents of my person wallet in search of anything that could be causing this. I came across the little magnetic strip in my wallet, I removed it, and since then, none of the alarms have been going off. Can these strips somehow get reactivated and cause the alarms to go off again? How do they work? Well, the way most of these work is they're a little, they've got a little tiny electric circuit in it. They've got an aerial around the outside of that. And then when you walk past one of those detectors, that puts radio frequency energy through you, and that powers up the circuit. And then the little circuit changes the frequency and sends out a code back to it and says, help, help, I'm being stolen, and the alarm goes off. 
Um, there are the one, there's the solid ones you find in clothes, which are attached. And the reason why you might think they're magnetic is the way you deactivate, where you take those off, is that sometimes they have a magnetic patch, which kind of disa- which lets them be taken apart without spreading dye all over your nice new clothes. Um, and so they just take those off. But that's not actually deactivating the tag. The tag will still set off the alarm. The ones which are actually stuck to the things you're buying um, are deactivated in a slightly different way. What they do is they have a little um, electronic thing with, a huge, with that huge power. It puts in so much power that it basically melts something in the circuit and causes so it to So that's break. how it stops it working. So it's, it's intact until you zap it. Yeah. And then when you, when you actually deactivate it by zapping it, it just melts all the components. Or it's probably it an overload of current. It probably through. melts a special fuse component, which is designed to break. So how did Catherine's one get reactivated then? I'm not entirely sure. I guess what happens is they only just broken. It only just broke, and then maybe the temperature changed a bit, and then the gap closed again, and so it, re- so it let the circuit work again, and so it will just about work again. So the Naked Scientist with Dr Chris, Dr Dave and Dr Phil. It's our Naked Science science phone-in. And if you have any questions for us on anything scientific, we'll be giving you the number in just a second because another reason to phone-in is we have a teaser operating tonight. We want to know what is the aurora, aurora borealis better known as? And so far tonight, we've definitely got Philip in Colchester who's got the right answer. Everyone else out there, give us a call in and let us know. Up for grabs is a copy of Naked Science, which is uh, my fun and funky science book for Christmas. All, all you have to do, tell us what is the Aurora Borealis. And don't forget, we've also got our kitchen science running. Dave told you that he was mixing milk and vinegar together. Have you had a go yet? Bit of milk, a couple of tablespoons full of vinegar, put them together, tell us what happens. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. Now it's time to cross the Atlantic for our science update from Bob and Chelsea. This week they'll be telling us about how rats can help engineers and robots in your guts. This week for the Naked Scientists, we're going to talk about biomimetics, that is, a type of engineering that aims to imitate biological systems. I'll tell you about a new robot snail that could soon be crawling through your intestines. But first, Chelsea tells us what engineers are learning from rats. In the future, autonomous robots could use artificial whiskers to help them sense their surroundings. In fact, engineers Mitra Hartman and Joseph Solomon of Northwestern University have built a prototype of robotic whiskers that may work a lot like those on rats. Hartman says the key is to measure how much the whiskers bend as they sweep across an object. And suppose an object is close and the whisker rotates into it, and suppose it rotates into that object fast. Well, then the, the whisker is going to bend a lot very quickly. If the object is far away and it's rotating at the same speed, it's not going to bend as much. Using this system, her team was able to recreate a 3D image of a face. Aside from helping autonomous robots navigate, the whiskers could check parts on an assembly line, generate 3D models, or feel for obstructions in pipelines. Thanks, Chelsea. And speaking of pipelines, a robotic snail may someday crawl through the human intestine to diagnose diseases. According to biomedical engineer Dimitra Dodu at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, such a device could provide a more comfortable alternative to colonoscopy. She says the challenge is finding a way to navigate the intestine's uneven, slippery terrain. Imagine that you have to move inside a deflated balloon and it is covered with a lubricated material. Rather than fight the lubrication, Dodu and her colleagues sought to imitate the snail, which both sticks to and slides on its trail of slime. They found that chemicals called mucoadhesives created enough friction for a simple device to walk across a pig's intestine. They're also fine-tuning patterns of motion in order to create a sure-footed prototype robot that still treads lightly on delicate tissue. Thanks, Bob. We'll be back next week to tell you about the space telescope NASA has planned to replace Hubble. Until then, I'm Chelsea Wald. And I'm Bob Hershon for AAAS, the Science Society. Back to you, Naked Scientists. Thank you very much, Bob and Chelsea from Science Update. There's more details about Science Update on their website at scienceupdate.com. Now, it's been a, a week or two which has really recreated something which I don't think Ian Fleming could have recreated in the James Bond series, stories about KGB people knocking off ex-Russian agents and Alexander Litvinenko's death from polonium-210 poisoning. But what actually is polonium-210 and how does it actually do away with people when you get inside your body? How do you get hold of it? How do you get inside your body? Well, the editor of Chemistry World from the Royal Society of Chemistry, Mark Peplow, joins us to tell us. Hi, Mark. Hi, Chris. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for, for agreeing to tell us a bit about polonium. 
What actually is it, and where, if I wanted to get some, say um, for non nefarious reasons, where would I get it? Well, this is one of the uh, most bizarre things about this case. It's a very, very rare element. It's a sort of silvery-coloured metal. Uh, now, when it was first discovered uh, by Marie and Pierre Curie uh, back in 1897, they did it by trawling through uh, uranium ore. Uh, but you only get about 100 micrograms of this stuff in every tonne of uranium ore. So these days you make it by uh, bombarding an element called bismuth with neutrons. Uh, now, really, the only way that you can do that is in an experimental nuclear reactor. So that means that someone actually must have had access to some pretty, pretty high-class technology to be able to do this. It's a well-planned and orchestrated attack then, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is something that um, you can't just go out and set up yourself. There are maybe only about 40 facilities around the world that are capable of making this stuff. Uh, funnily enough, um, uh, Russia actually exports about 8 grams of polonium-210 every month, um, all of it to the U.S. It does have a very, very small use, actually to help discharge, uh, uh, discharge static that builds up in certain types of machinery. Um, but um, other than that, it's, uh, it, it's really not made uh, very much at all around the world. So how much would you need to get inside your body to be harmful? Well, the maximum safe dose that you could get away with is seven trillionths of a gram. I mean, that's a minuscule amount. Uh, the sorts of doses um, that Litvinenko uh, uh, took uh, or was given, um, according to the doctors, it was uh, substantial enough to cause this very rapid onset of radiation poisoning. That may only be micrograms or milligrams, though, so it's the sort of amount that uh, you know, could constitute something smaller than a pea. Why do you think someone would have gone for such an exotic way to kill someone? Wouldn't, say, lead poisoning in the form of a bullet be more effective and, and probably easier? Yeah, it's very bizarre. I mean, this, is, uh, this now gets into the realms of the, the sort of spy thriller um, and something which is really speculation. Um, from one point of view, it sends out a very powerful message that whoever has done this um, does have access to some very serious pieces of kit and is able to move radioactive material around the world almost certainly. Um, on the other hand, it may have been a genuine attempt to try and disguise um, the mode of poisoning of this guy um, because obviously uh, he, was, he was sick for quite a few weeks before people realised exactly what had poisoned him, despite the fact that experts at University College London had been uh, testing him, looking at him, trying to treat him. And this may have been one of the reasons for using the polonium. It's just simply so rare, and there's no other documented cases of deliberate poisoning by this metal, that um, it may have been to try and cover up the fact that this guy had been poisoned in this way. You don't think that, for instance, it's, it's a KGB calling card. They're saying you can't prove anything, but uh, it's pretty obvious who's done it. Well, like I said, it, it may be a, a, a very sort of obvious way to say, look, we have the technology, we can get to you with some really exotic, bizarre stuff that you need some serious power uh, and contacts to be able to get hold of. So, yes, that may be one explanation. And once you've got this stuff inside your body, why does it actually make you unwell? Well, um, because it gives out radiation, the type of radiation it gives out is called alpha particles. Uh, it's a bundle of uh, two protons and two neutrons, the little particles that make up uh, all the uh, uh, atoms that make up all the different elements in the universe. These alpha particles um, can work in two ways. Basically, because they're positively charged, they can rip electrons away from uh, the molecules that are found in your cells, in your body cells, that are responsible for doing all the biochemistry needed to keep you living. In doing so, they make things called free radicals, and that can help to break down all the different biochemical reactions that are going on. That can cause you illness. In the longer term, uh, the alpha radiation can also damage DNA in your cells. It can damage it to such an extent, in fact, that the cell realizes how badly warped its DNA has become, and that can actually shut down. The cell will kill itself in a process called apoptosis because its DNA has undergone uh, such rapid damage. Mark, thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Chris.
That's uh, Mark Peplow, who's the editor of Chemistry World, which is the magazine of the Royal Society of Chemistry, commenting there on the death of Alexander Litvinenko from polonium-210 poisoning. What was polonium-210? Where does it come from? And it looks like you need some pretty hard-hitting kit in order to do it. And on the teaser, we've had a huge response so far. Um, loads of people getting it right. Andy in the A120, William in Ipswich, Catherine in Fakenham, Roy in Kettering, Ron in Long Stutton, Simon in Braintree, David in Felixstowe, Brian in Corby, Norman in Hudstanton, David in Felixstowe, Deb in Braintree is also doing great with the kitchen science, and Ian in Watford all getting it right. And remember, if you want to give us a call and let us know the answer to this question, what is the Aurora Borealis better known as? If you think you know the, if you think you know the answer, or you have some science questions for us, then give us a call now on 0845 30 50 007 or text 07786 20 105 or email chris at thenakedscientist.com. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. For more information, get online at nakedscientists.com. It is the Naked Scientist. Mike in Oldham joins us. Hi, Mike. Oh, I'm not in Oldham, I'm in Molden. Molden? Oh, hi, right. Well, yeah, that's right. on the Essex coast, isn't it? I know where Molden yeah, is. It says yeah. Oldham. I was going to say, that's quite a long way away, isn't it? What do you want to talk um, about, Mike? Um, well, I was always taught that, that space had a curvature. And if that's true, and the, ex- the universe is, the Hubble has proved that the universe is expanding at a phenomenal rate, which is presumably faster than we're moving, how long before it sort of goes round the circle and kicks us up the backside? Again, that's another really good question that no one's quite knows the answer to. You're right in saying that there have been theories that space has got a curvature. Actually, the most recent results show that it hasn't got a curvature at all. It might be actually completely flat, or it's so close to flat that we can't tell the difference between curved and flat. How but, would you answer that question, though, Phil? How, how are people trying to, to determine whether space is flat, disk world, or whether it's round? It, it's quite a, a tough question to get over. It's all to do with the speeds that things are, are, are flying away from us at. Uh, and to do with things so- that where, basically, if space has a curvature, if you imagine measuring the angles in a triangle on a flat piece of paper, they add up to 180 degrees. On a curved space, that's not the case. So it's trying to get these geometries to try and work out how on earth, uh, well, what exactly the curvature is. And as I say, at the moment, it looks like everything is completely flat, or at least very, very close to it. Would you like to have a quick go at the quiz, Mike? Sounds wrong. Mike, um, would yeah. you like to have a quick go at our quiz? Yeah, sure. A PET scan is a system that's usually employed by vets to image sick animals. Do you think that's science fact or science fiction? Fiction. Yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, PET actually stands for positron emission tomography. It's a kind of imaging technique to see where the blood's going around your body. Well done, Mike. One point. A Botox is used to iron out wrinkles... Botox that's used to iron out wrinkles normally comes from a virus. Is that science fact or science fiction? Uh, well, yeah, it's used to iron out I don't really know. I, I, a virus? I, I would think that's fiction. Absolutely true. Botox is a toxin produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum, which causes uh, food poisoning. Oh, right. So you, you were right, but uh, it, it, it still was from a sort of microbiological entity, but it wasn't a virus, it was a bacteria, Mike. All oh, right. Great having you on the programme and a great question. Actually, I'll tell you what, I've, um, I've got one of your... If I do get pulled out of the hat, I have got one of your signs, signed books. Ah, have you? You right. lucky man. Yeah. Um, do you like so, it? Yes, I do, very much so. Um, but, so if I get it again... Mm. Uh, What's the chances that you can put a question up that's got several logical answers <laughs> and you give uh, a signed book of yours anyway to the winner, but to give my one to the best wrong logical answer? Oh, fair enough. All right, then. Well, that's very, that's very charitable of you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah? Sounds like a good suggestion. Thanks for joining Hi. us on the programme. No problem. Simon's in Norwich. Hi, Simon. Hello, good evening, uh, Chris. Good to have you on the programme. What would you like to talk about? Um, well, basically, my question is, what limits the length of the human life? Well, there are a number of things that can determine how long we live for. Uh, the first thing is the rate of your, meta- your metabolism. Because if you compare, say, a mouse with a human, then we're very, very genetically similar to mice. But if you look at the heart rate of a mouse, it's running along at several hundred beats a minute, whereas our heart's beating 50 times a minute. So a mouse, in order to survive because it's so small, has to run its body very, very fast. It's almost like you being whipped along by a slave driver very, very much faster. And so in a mouse, the cells are growing faster, they're dividing more, they're doing everything more quickly, and so the mouse burns itself out more quickly than a bigger animal, like a human. If you compare animals like tortoises, which are cold-blooded, they're big, they're cold-blooded, 
and their, their metabolism is running much more slowly. Giant tortoises can live for 100, maybe 200 years. So it's down to the speed of your metabolism. Scientists have found whales in the ocean, actually, that uh, might even be several hundred years old. There are harpoon tips which have been recovered from the blubber of whales that date back historically to the types of harpoons that weren't being used for several hundred years, leading scientists to conclude that they are really quite old. And also, isn't there things called telomeres, which are like when you copy your DNA, it, at your body adds an extra bit every time a, a cell copies, and the more, the more times it's copied, the less well the cells work until eventually you die. Yes, that, that this is what Dave's referring to, um, Simon, is these structures which are on the ends of each of your chromosomes, these telomeres, and they're almost like the pieces of sellotape you find around the end of your boot laces that keep the lace from fraying. Now, every time a cell divides, it erodes a little piece off of that, and so they get shorter and shorter and shorter. If you look at cancer cells that seem to live forever, they have uh, switched on an enzyme that makes those things get longer and longer and longer. So that seems to be what gives the cell life or the ability to continue to divide forever. But the, the problem is eventually these things get down to zero and that seems to determine how many times a cell can divide. It's actually called the Hayflick number, so there's a limited number of times a cell can divide. But that's obviously not why someone dies, because their cells stop dividing. They usually die because something has damaged their DNA and caused the cells to work less well, and so you get things like cancer. Right. Would you like to go at our quiz? Yeah, I'd love to go, yeah. The driest desert on Earth is the Gobi. Is that science fact or science fiction? Fact. I'm afraid not. The Earth's driest place is the Atacama Desert in the coast of Chile, um, with only one tenth of a millimetre of rain a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Simon, you actually needed two out of two to stay in the game this week because oh, well, everyone's doing very well. But thank you for taking part. Thank you. Good show. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Just time to sneak in Duncan, who's in Braintree. Hi, Duncan. Hi. Hi. Welcome Hi. to The Naked Scientist. What do you want thank to talk you. about? Um, well, it's about a fly landing on the ceiling. <laughs> because it has to turn itself to 180 degrees. Mm. So does it do a half roll or a half loop? <laughs> and, and when it gets there, how can it be um, aerodynamically correct? Because its wings will be beating the wrong way. Yeah, flies are quite cunning. Um, if you look at the end of their, uh, their feet, well, they've got a little hooks. They've got little grappling hooks on the end of their feet. And when they're going towards the surface, they literally have to throw themselves straight upwards towards the ceiling. So their head points towards the thing they want to hit, and they reach out with their front legs, and they grab hold of something spiky or rough that they can latch these miniature grappling hooks on, and then they switch off and fold their wings away and swing their body under them to lock onto the, floor, onto the ceiling. And so they're hanging on upside down. Now, when they want to, to drop away again, gravity does the work for them. They can just let themselves go, but they hang on with some feet first, obviously, so that one part of their body drops away and then the rest of their body drops after it, so they're in the right position to then begin flying again. And people know this because they wondered that very question. And when someone clever invented a camera that could take pictures fast enough, called time-lapse photography, something you can get pictures now at 4,000 times a second, so you can see individual wing beats of insects and things, that they were able to work out exactly how they're doing this. Ah, oh, right. I've, I've been wondering for a bit, but I haven't, I haven't been able to find out how, you know, any sort of time-lapse photography on it. Do you want a quick go at the quiz? Yes, please. South Africa is the world's leading producer of diamonds. Do you think that's fact or fiction? South Africa. Africa, um, fact. Unfortunately not. South Africa's actually fourth behind Canada, Russia, and the number one is Botswana, which turns up $2.57 billion worth of shiny stones each year. Mm. Nick, you, okay. need, you actually needed two out of two, Duncan, I'm sorry. OK, not a problem. Well Thanks done. Thank you much indeed for your help. That's right. Thank you for Thank joining you. us on Bye. The Naked Scientists. It is The Naked Scientists with Dr Chris, Dr Dave and Dr Phil. It's our Naked Scientists science phone-in. Any question on anything? If you want to have a go and uh, ask us any, any questions this week, it's 0845 30 50 007 on the telephone. You can text in on 07786 20 1035 or you can email chris at nakedscientist.com. Another reason to get in touch is to have a go at our teaser, Phil. Our teaser this week is, what is the Aurora Borealis better known as? Stripping down science. OK, let's do it. The Naked Scientists. And this is The Naked Scientists with Dr Chris, Dr Dave and Dr Phil. And we asked you earlier what would happen if you mixed up some milk and some vinegar and you stir them all up. And what do you get? Well, joining us to tell us what she found in her kitchen is Deborah, who's in Braintree. Hello, Deborah. Hello. And what happened when you did our experiment? 
it went a sort of funny, curdling mess. Right. What, what, do, what do you think the science is there? What do you think's going on? Well, it's, it's um, acid and alkali mixing. OK. And did it smell nice? No. It made my son feel rather nauseous and he tipped it down the sink rather quick. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, well, let's go back to Derek. You stay on the line, Deborah. We'll see if you're right, because Derek uh, and Dave were out this week uh, in... in uh, where, where, where did you go to, Dave, for this? In Kettering. Are you in Kettering? Let's go and see what they found. Hello there. Welcome back to Southfield School for Girls, and uh, we're here with some milk and vinegar and a couple of glasses and some tissue paper ready to do the experiment. So uh, here we go. Verity and Amanda are ready to do it. And Amanda has actually been jumping around for the, the interim uh, because she's very keen to do it. So there you go. Anyway, Dave, why don't you in- in- instruct Amanda what to do next? Well, Amanda, if you'd just like to pour a couple of tablespoons of vinegar in there and we'll see what happens. OK, so we've already got the milk in the glass and we'd like Amanda to do it and then say what you see. <laughs> if you can smell this here, they are actually completely right. It's a very nasty sort of... Oh, blimey. Can we actually handle being close to this mixture? OK, if we can hold our breath and peer in. Uh, Verity, what can we see um, in the liquid? Um, white cloudy stuff is forming on top of the milk. OK, um, any thoughts on that, Amanda? What can you kind of see over the top? It's a bit like curds and whey. Oh, OK. I think we've had a... Brilliant insight there. OK, what, what are we seeing here, Dave? I mean, it looks like we've got kind of globules of stuff at the top of the milk. I mean, we've got another stage to do, actually, here, haven't we? So why don't we do the next stage? OK, if you'd like to take um, some kitchen towel and filter it through into the other glass and see what happens. These guys are still kind of retching at the smell. But OK, if you can pour it in. OK, and what can you see there now, Verity? It's a bit like runny cheese. Vomit. <laughs> it's a bit like vomit, OK. Oh, God. But what does this liquid look like now? I mean, what are we getting coming through um, when we look down into the glass? What what can you see, Amanda? It's a lot clearer than the original uh, solution. Okay, and what's being left in the actual tissue paper? Any thoughts, Verity? What does it look like? It does actually look like curds and whey. Sounds pretty good, yeah. So we've got this pretty clear liquid coming through. It's a little bit cloudy, I suppose, but it's basically coming through nicely into the bottom of the pint glass. And then if we open up the tissue paper to see what's in there... It looks like an actual yoghurt. Cottage cheese. Yeah, it looks like cottage cheese, doesn't it? So, um, anyone up for trying it? You want me to eat it? Uh, I'm not actually going to force you. I think. I mean, the thing about this is, because we've made it with vinegar, it probably isn't going to be very nice. Um, but it does indeed look a lot like cottage cheese. You're absolutely right. So, really, we need to know what's been going on here. These guys have, quite correctly, been mentioning the words curds and whey, so they're pretty much on the right track. But what, what are we actually doing here, Dave? Well, milk's made up of um, little globules of fat in water, basically. And in those, around that, there's also a protein called casein. And normally the little lumps of protein are negatively charged, um, and which means they all repel each other because like charges repel. And if you add an acid, you get um, positively charged hydrogen, in the, which is actually what an acid is. You get H plus ions, and they negate the charge of the negatively charged casein, which means that it doesn't repel each other, and it sticks together. And so instead of having lots of little lumps which are push, pushing themselves apart, they all stick together and form the big blobs, leaving only the stuff which is actually dissolved in the water left in the clear liquid at the bottom. So that is? Yeah, that's whey, as you were saying, and the lumps are curds. You could then take the curds and squish all the water out of them and squash them down, maybe add a bacteria or some um, moulds to give them some taste, and then you get cheese. OK, so we are part way to making cheese here, although if we did make this stuff into cheese, would it actually be very nice? It would taste very strongly of vinegar and probably be quite foul. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Most cheeses actually, they, they do this coagulation process using uh, something called rennet, which you get out of the fourth stomach of a baby calf, which they use to actually absorb the milk from their mother. Oh, I see. So the rennet is actually uh, an acid again. It's got acidic stuff in it, has it? It's not actually an acid. It's just an enzyme which attacks the protein and affects it similarly to the, to the way an acid does, but not without being acidic. Oh, I see. So that will do something else, but still make it form these globules, which are the curds, and then you can go and make that into cheese. Lovely stuff. OK. And during that explanation, Verity and Amanda were high-fiving each other, no less, because they got it right, essentially. They predicted that it was curds and whey. So you must be feeling very good about that, Verity. Yes. OK. And are you guys going to go and make some cheese now, using all the proper stuff, get some rennet and so on? Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it might happen. You never know. OK, well, thank you very much to Amanda and Verity from Southfield School for Girls and also to Dave setting up the experiment. So we'll, of course, be back next week somewhere from the east of England doing some more science, which hopefully you can do at home. So until then, it's goodbye.
Thank you very much to Derek and also to Verity and Dave who went out this week to do that and Amanda too. They are at Southfield Girls for School in Northampton. Deborah, looks like you got it right. Well done. Thank you very much. I'll give you a copy of Naked Science, my fun and funky book for Christmas. Brilliant. How about that? Thank you very much. It's been great having you on the programme and well done for, for taking part. Thank you. Cheers then. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you very much. It is The Naked Scientist with Chris, Dave and Phil. We've got time to squeeze in a few more science questions just before we finish. So if you want to ask us anything, just get calling now 0845 30 50 007. Phil, who's won our teaser? OK, our teaser this week was what is the Aurora Borealis better known as? It is, of course, the Northern Lights. We've had a great response this week. Actually, you also get it at the South Pole as well, the Southern Lights. They're called the Borealis Australis. Uh, sorry, the Aurora Australis. Uh, and our winner this week is Doris in Tiptree in Essex. Congratulations, Doris. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to squeeze this one in very quickly. Colin's in Norwich. Hi, Colin. Hello. What would you like to ask? We've only got about a minute or two. Right, we have an aircraft. Travels at 1,000 miles an hour. Equipped with two guns, one at the front, one at the back, the bullets fire at a thousand miles an hour. If it fires forward, what will the speed of the bullet be doing? And if it fires backwards, what will the speed of the bullet be doing? Okay, um, this is moving relatively slowly, so there's no problems with relativity. So all you do have to do is add up the speeds. So the one going forwards will be going at a thousand miles an hour plus a thousand miles an hour, so two thousand. The one going backwards will be a thousand minus a thousand, so not at all, and it will fall straight down. There you go. How about that for a slick answer, Colin? That's very good. You must have been asked this before. <laughs> I, told, I gave him about 30 seconds warning, actually, and, uh, and told him not to mention relativity because he wanted to start talking about Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a very quick go at the quiz? No, no, thanks, no. Okie dokie. It's been great having you on the programme. Good question. Thanks, Colin. Bye. Colin in Norwich. Well, we're pretty much running out of time. I have one very, very swift one to ask you, Dave, which came in from your hand warmer experiment the other day, which was in a recent segment you talked about hand warmers and the correspondent forgot to explain what the metal disc does to initiate the crystallisation in the hand warmer, the thing that you pop. What actually is that? How does it work? In order to initiate the crystallisation, you need a crystal to start with. Um, in the disc, there's a little crack which is closed up, and when you click it, it opens that crack, and inside that crack, a couple of crystals were trapped from last time you made a load of crystals. It releases them, which is enough to trigger the um, crystallisation it gives off lots of warm and warms heat and warms up your hands nicely very quick one here for either of you two do you like curry i love curry i'm a big curry fan okay well we want to know in fact joe thomas wants to know uh he's uh, interested in frying poppadoms when you fry poppadoms why do they curl up upwards away from the layer of oil and not downwards any clues no, you've stumped, you've stumped me. I think we'll have to leave that one for everyone at home. If you know why poppadoms curl up upwards rather than downwards when you put them in a pan, do give us a line. Chris at NakedScientist.com. You have been listening to Dr Dave, Dr Phil and me, Dr Chris, this week on The Naked Scientist. Next time we're going to be exploring the deep reaches of the universe and also the science of the Big Bang and how the universe is still expanding. We'll also be skimming across the surface of Mars aboard Mars 3D, which is a project to map the red planet from space and also finding out how solar flares can screw up communications here on Earth. So if you've got any questions about any of those things, send them over now to chris at nakedscientist.com. In the meantime, do give the Nature podcast a listen for more up-to-the-minute scientific discoveries. That's at nature.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget, you can also join the discussion about anything scientific on our discussion forum at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. A huge thank you to our production team here at The Naked Scientist. That's Petro Minch and Anna Lacey. And thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye.